All right, there we go. And no, I have to push that. There we go. We're gonna do this. I'm excited. I'm ready to go. That's my dynamite here. Ooh, good for you. Oh, it went. I had it, and then it disappeared. Maybe one of the kids took it. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the podcast. This is the Banned Books Podcast, episode number 150-something. 54. Oh, I was going to say five. Well, because last week was supposed to be 53, 54, and I decided I was late, and I just, well, I'd just leave it as one episode. So Yeah, sure. Why not? Yeah. As always, we are your hosts, Christopher Gillespie. Chillin' and willin'. Maxon. You are like relaxing duck, but yet with coffee beans. Yeah, that's right. I swim coffee in coffee background. So <laughs> give a vault. For mm-hmm. those of you who don't know, Gillespie actually has a vault underneath his house in rural Wisconsin, and it's actually millions of tons of coffee beans. And Ooh, he swims in it I'm stockp- well, no, yeah, that's true. I'm stockpiling them, you know, for the apocalypse. Because at least we'll have coffee then. And I am Donovan Riley. I had uh, espresso and then immediately followed it up with pre workout which I'm now discovering is a concoction that I probably shouldn't have done on an empty stomach. Mm. My brain is, uh, well, as you discovered before we hit record, my brain is on fire this morning. Uh, kind of. I'm <laughs> on fire for topics that we're not going to discuss on the show. Active. It's very active. <laughs> it's like a prairie fire of activity. And uh, let's see. Oh, you, you did put out a request not that long ago for uh, more reviews, right? Did I? Oh, that's yeah, right. You did. We, yeah, you, to top the thinking fellows. Right. So we didn't get that. any new ones since then. <laughs> so, but I Good. think it was at the end of a very long episode. So mm. uh, I thought I'd read a couple of them here. One, bravo each episode. All right. So that's from that's a great review. Is Five that a review stars. Of us or the channel? Mm, no, that's us. Okay. That's us. That's us. Then we got a one star review. Yes. Unfortunate change. Unfortunate um, and actually, change. The, yeah, the last episode was a reflection on this. <laughs> Review. It started out as a great podcast. I love their biblical based theology. I don't want to mock this uh, writer. Thanks don't for your him. review. Uh, but lately, review. Riley has gone all political and is out of all his political. element mm-hmm. and unaware of the fact. All right. I regret that I must. The fact that I, grew, I was raised by a political scientist and U.S. historian. Mm-hmm. Yes. Correct. I'm, I'm unaware you're of that. You're unaware fact. of that you're all political. I regret that I must unsubscribe. Fortunately, one of Riley's teachers, Stephen Paulson, has started a new podcast, Luther's Outlaw God for 1517 Podcast Network. Go subscribe to that show. It's good. Um, and I'll be using my time to listen to that instead. Well, that's a great show. So I'm glad you're listening to that show. Stephen Paulson is a hack. And as far as a theologian, he's a he's a he's a C squad <laughs> theologian at best. <laughs> Intellectually, he's a midget. And, uh, <laughs> spoken by one of his students, so I don't know. Spoken by his student, yes. He was my graduate advisor after uh, my original thesis advisor retired. Oh, man. No, I love, uh, I'm joking, uh, I love Steve more than just about anybody, actually. I love him um, for what he did for me and for my family, actually. When my daughter was on death's door. In yeah, that's right. And he was the only person who came and preached to us and prayed with us. Yeah, thank God for and that. So to this day, my daughter is 13 going on 14. Every time we meet or talk on the phone, the very first thing he says is, how is my, my Alma? Wow. To me, like I said, at that time too, you know, if you're not a parent, when your child, especially she was two months old, so yeah. she's in an oxygen tent, she's two months old. People were telling us, friends, family, some of my professors, even our pastor was saying, you need to, to prepare for the worst. Like, what if she dies? Hmm. And I said, I know for a fact she's not going to die. I just, I knew. Hmm? I can't explain why I knew. I just knew. Right. And people kept uh, chastising me for saying that and pushing us towards, well, you have to prepare. You have to prepare. And we actually kicked a couple of people out of the hospital room for coming in and saying those things to us. You, so you were kind of like the opposite of David. David was like all yeah, preparing no, for the death nope. of his son. And then after nope. he died, he was all good. Yep. Nope. <laughs> opposite no, that's not that. my relationship with our Lord. Uh-uh. And, uh, and so when Steve came to visit us in the hospital, there was none of that. He walked in, he um, prayed over her, prayed over us, prayed with us, and then preached to us for like two hours. Yeah, beautiful. And relentlessly. And if you've ever listened to, to Dr. Paulson, <laughs> he's relentless. So if you've ever listened to me, you'll understand how he and I get along. <laughs> yeah, there's a degree of intensity there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'd like some more reviews, by the way, mm-hmm. uh, and five stars yeah. and whatnot. That's how people find I find out about the show. Although uh, the, there's another review that said that I guess we were mentioned on Thinking Fellows. So there you go, uh, listeners to Thinking Fellows. Thanks for joining us. It's and very then thoughtful uh, of them. 
And then, uh, you know, we promo my coffee periodically. Um, there, I kind of make it obvious if you watch the video, but uh, right. yeah, I've been seeing quite a few 15, 17 customers, Good. you know, making Excellent. it that way. So thanks for that. Yeah. Think Pays for the yourself. bills, feeds like the kids. Like said numerous times, we're having a conversation and whether you agree or you disagree mm. or you're indifferent, that's fine. Yeah. That's fine. That's good, actually. I'd prefer that you think and disagree or call us out on something that you disagree with or think that we're right. uninformed or misinformed or just off in the weeds than blindly listen to us and just nod your head and say, well, whatever they say is right and I'll agree with it. Yeah, I'm thinking about uh, you know podcasts that I used to subscribe to and I no longer do. Mm -hmm. And it's usually because I got bored with them. It was yeah, absolutely. whether I agreed or disagreed didn't matter, actually. Yeah. Um, it was that they were so utterly predictable the show is so right. predictable um yeah. and, and repetitive mm -hmm. that um you know i got bored with it and we don't want to yeah. i mean if we got bored with ourselves here on this show that's right. what that's how it would happen yeah <laughs> it's like oh we're talking about the same thing again mm -hmm. and if you want to know like you said in the last two episodes we kind of engaged in a pastor's table talk about right the question of whether you can preach the gospel in the absence or long gospel in the it absence was one episode of... that didn't get split by the way oh okay well, in that episode, according <laughs> to my producer, that episode, singular, we address this because for me as a pastor, and this is kind of uh, pointing towards the topic for today too, Yeah. Uh, can you, as a pastor, preacher, teach in the absence of what's happening in the world? Is the church in the world, but not of the world, and to the extent that we do have to, like we were talking about before we hit record, we see our vocation as pastors as being the watchman who stands on the wall because most of the people in my congregation, just talking for myself, they don't have the time or the ability to focus on topics that I focus on because they have a job. They have mm -hmm. other responsibilities. Yeah. They can't go down these rabbit holes. Part of my being a pastor is that my congregation affords me the freedom to take responsibility for such topics as politics, social current events, human trafficking, yeah. human trafficking, these right. kinds of things. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in these things. I've followed these things. You can go listen to the warrior priest podcast where I address this in the most recent episode. This is something that's affected me personally for a very long time. So I'm very focused on it and always have been. I'm focused on drug and alcohol addiction being one, but there are other topics that I, I don't focus on because they're not in my wheelhouse and they don't draw my attention because they don't, they're just not a part of, of where I come from. Right. Uh, and so being a part of that post Vietnam generation that was raised by a Vietnam vet, and we've talked about this at length, being a part of Gen X, the way that I was raised, the experiences that I had as a child. And then when I got on on my own, they pointed me to, in a direction that even as a pastor, then I don't just abandon those, those points. I don't just turn my face away from them. But at the same time, I also understand and to a certain extent can respect if you're coming from another place and saying, well, you're off in the weeds, you're, you're wrong. Right. You don't know what you're talking about. Well, actually I do. <laughs> and I'm very well educated and knowledgeable about political science and politics and political philosophy because I've studied it since I was in high school. But I also respect the fact that you don't agree with my perspective or in the moment, in the conversation, I'm, maybe I'm wrong in the sense that I'm not expressing myself well enough. Or, or we get caught in diagnostic and don't get to the preaching, right? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And that well, happens. In, let's go off on this topic and use it as a segue because I've been mm -hmm. thinking about this. Is that, so I do listen to those criticisms. I did read the email. Mm -hmm. And I did, after my initial, you know, piss off reaction, take a step back and said, okay, but he said it. I don't know you personally. I don't right. know why you're saying this, but it doesn't matter. Let me read this a second time or a third time and really kind of ruminate and do a kind of like self audit, uh, a sobriety check as we call it. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I've been also having a conversation with in another area is the distinction between confidence and arrogance. Ah, uh, yes. That I am a very self-confident person. And that's a very recent thing for me within the last five years. Whereas before the last five years, my self-confidence was a projection of my insecurities. I was so, going to say, yeah, you, you right. put on pretty, a pretty good show of being right. confident, but it was really insecurity. It was insecurity and it was, in psychological terms, a need to kind of stroke my ego because I was very insecure, very afraid of being seen as a fraud, being seen as weak. And so over the last five years, becoming self-confident, I've also then noticed 
something like kind of a dichotomy of one, it's easy to stray back into open blatant arrogance because mm -hmm. I am so confident in my abilities or my knowledge base, which I think comes with decades of study, decades of training, decades of practice. Yeah, it's not unfounded. But at the same time, recognizing also that as I've been told by people, I'm intimidating because of my self-confidence. Hmm. That people who aren't confident are intimidated by my confidence and therefore they mistake it for arrogance. Mm -hmm. Because I do think out loud and I am outspoken, obviously. And that can come off as arrogance or self-confidence depending on what room I'm in and who I'm around. So on that topic then, like you said, often we will go deep, deep, deep into diagnostics but forget about the prognosis. Or right, right. at least touch upon the prognosis, which also, by the way, is the way I like to preach now. I would much rather preach a sermon that's like 90% law and then at the very end just hit it hard with the gospel. Mm -hmm. Because to me, that's just my personality type too, though. I like painting myself into a corner diagnostically and leaving no room for anything except Jesus and the gospel. Yeah, what are we left with? Jesus. <laughs> right. That's all that's left, yeah. After and at all least, for, like you and I talk about so often off the air, because we have such a low anthropology, mm -hmm. I think for myself anyways, it's that challenge is a welcome challenge of saying, okay, God, lead me in a direction where every single outlet, every single off ramp, every, every single escape hatch is taken away. Yeah. So that the law is turned, the screw is turned so tight that at the end you've exhausted all logic theologic, philosophical logic, and you're only left with either it's Jesus and the word of God and the power of the word and the power of the resurrection, or, well, like we were talking about, the entire Bible is just a long conspiracy theory meant to deceive the unsuspecting public sheeple mm -hmm. for power, for money, for whatever it might be. Yeah, and I, I mean, I would dispute whether, I mean, it's, it's too well written for it to be a great conspiracy. And then right. again, uh, we've seen some pretty good conspiracies that are pretty well written, right? You know, in our own time. Um, well, I was thinking, you, yeah, go ahead. I was thinking about our people, though, and and we look at our, uh, you know, as we look at our people, and we we do have that low anthropology. It doesn't mean we think less of them as individuals. Um, I think what it is is that we ha we have a great deal more sympathy for the way that they have that they struggle um, right. with with God with one another the way that. Um, they, you know, as we have been, you know, naive to their own shortcomings, their own failing, and the right. way that they, they don't address um, their real, you know, spiritual issues. Right. Well, and as an example, a rather provocative point, I'm at the point now where I think COVID-19 is this generation's WMD. And that every month there's more and more false flags being thrown up by politicians in order to control the public and, and basically engage in social engineering for political reasons. That's my opinion. And there are certainly plenty of people in my congregation who believe the opposite. Now, I am confident that my opinion is correct. <laughs> they are confident that their opinion is correct. As a pastor, my opinion in this area has to be superseded by compassion and empathy right. and kindness right. Right. to recognize I disagree with your conclusion. And in some cases, I disagree with your logic and how you got to your conclusion because it's purely based on emotion from what you're saying to me. But I am first and foremost your pastor. And if I attack you or, excuse me, I speak in such a way that I make you, I belittle you or I'm right. condescending toward you right. because I'm right, you're wrong. I, that's arrogance to me. And I definitely am tempted to do that because of my frustration with where the conversation is at currently, both politically and just in the media, mm -hmm. and then how it kind of plays itself out in my relationships. But as a pastor, I have to remember all the time, the temptation is to take control of the conversation and forget, I'm supposed to shepherd you to the Lord's table. Because yeah. that's, re that's your really, that's your only source of, of peace and security. So if I'm a, if I'm belligerent, if I'm condescending, if I'm demeaning toward you, I might walk away saying, I showed him. Well, what did I show him though? Yeah. What I showed him is there's no place at the Lord's table for him now. Mm. So therefore, am I right? No, I'm just not. <laughs> I'm just not right. 
versus is it about being right or like the psalmist says in Psalm 119, which we studied yesterday, Psalm 119 verse... I was say, 40, you didn't do the whole thing. <laughs> yeah, I just ripped through it. <laughs> that's, that's how good I am. Um, we just kind of flew over the top. Well, it's really about affliction and the word of God and blop, done. Um, but we're in Psalm 119 verses 41 through 48. Mm-hmm. And the psalmist prays, do not remove the, your word of truth from my mouth. Yeah. And he's saying that in response to those who mock me, those who deride me, my enemies, those who seek to kill me, actually, even earthly authorities who seek to uh, call me out in public and vilify me. If you take the word of truth out of my mouth, the implication there is I have nothing to say. I have nothing to argue back against my enemies because really, and this went to my point, my enemies are morally evil and they plot my death because they're godless. Yeah. And that in the present tense, I think we create too clear of a division between the two tables of the commandments and don't see where they overlap, which is godless men do morally evil things because they've turned their back to God's word. Right. So when I look at you and I say, I'm going to kill this guy in David's case, the reason I can say that is because I no longer see David as a child of God. Right. I don't see God working in David's life. Therefore, when I kill David, whether it's for pious or impious reasons, it's not murder. But the only reason it's not murder is because what does God have to say about this? Mm -hmm. Whereas David is saying, if you take the word of truth out of my mouth, whatever I say will, won't be a lie. I mentioned, uh, I, it was a kind of a throwaway in the sermon. It wasn't in the manuscript, but I I just mentioned how, um, you know, when people, um, wanted to do whatever was in their heart and not, not what God had instructed, somehow they lost the book of the law again. Funny how that works, isn't it? Isn't that funny how they lost God's word when God's they wanted says, to do whatever they wanted? You God's know, God's word says that everything that comes out of our heart is evil all the days of our life. Oops, did anyone see where we put that word? No. Oh, okay. Well, right. we we should probably write some more words. Or as we heard this morning in uh, the devotion I did for the congregation from mm-hmm. uh, I think Isaiah thirty nine, and it's Isaiah speaking to Hezekiah, mm-hmm. and Isaiah's like, "Yeah, you're going to lose everything, and you're you know they're going to yeah. take your sons and make them eunuchs." Yeah, uh, in Babylon, and and Hezekiah is like, well, that's that's okay, or it's good because at least at least I'm going to have some, at least it's going to be well for me, you know. Right. It's like, oh my, <laughs> how can you yeah. accept that? Accept that word? I mean, I would just right. be like, um, you know, Isaiah, that's it for you. <laughs> right. I'm right. done with you. Well, and that goes back to the point is like we discussed at the opening. You may not like our political opinion you may not like our philosophical opinion but at least for us or at least for myself i can't simply turn a blind eye to what i believe is being taught in the prophets and the patriarchs mm-hmm. right about the fact that like i always talk about with joshua joshua was told point blank by god go in tell them here's your choice repent and give way or be annihilated and a lot of people were annihilated a lot of people it's a very bloody book. <laughs> right. But it also strikes me now, I, I never made this connection. Um, when Jesus talks to the rich young ruler and says, you know, mm-hmm. you have to give away everything to the poor yeah. and follow me. Yeah. And oh, he says, yeah, I yeah, can't, yeah. I can't do that. Yeah. It's very, it's not as violent. It's reminiscent though. But it is reminiscent. Yeah. There's this guy who's like, can't give up everything in order yeah. to be with Jesus. Actually, I would argue it's even more violent because it's spiritually violent. Bro, and right. This goes, yeah. this goes to Jesus' point in Matthew. It's like, oh, I sacked your village and, and murdered your people. Oh, if you think that's bad, wait until you're cast into hell. Right, yeah. You don't even know bad. Oh. And this leads us actually into our point about uh, war and just yeah. war theory and violence because it's something as a man who practices violence regularly as one of my <laughs> vocations, there's no getting around it. I teach as a it, source I of joy and pleasure. It's a great source of joy and pleasure for me. <laughs> and, you know, that's where my self-confidence came from. Um and it's also a topic that I, in my opinion, is not adequately covered anymore. And it was for a long time. Mm-hmm. Now it's just not even like when we read Luther on whether a soldier can be a Christian. Right. I know a lot of Lutherans who aren't even aware that that exists. That that, well, maybe that the question is asked, but not that Luther addressed it. Right, right. right. Well, I don't really get asked that question anymore because like you and I were talking before we hit record most church bodies kind of sort themselves out along political lines. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And this is one of those things. So you'll, there's church bodies that are pro-war, pro, I mean, pro-war in a general sense, but pro-soldier, 
uh, in a very specific sense. And then you'll have other church bodies who are anti-war. They'll march to protest any arms right. action, whether it be Iraq, Afghanistan, or other places. So if you're conservative theologically, then you're going to be conservative politically. Right, right. Okay. Or, and, and liberal theologically, and then liberal yeah, politically. I know I'm probably, I'm going to get in trouble for this, but I, not even sometimes. A lot of times I think it's blind allegiance. Mm -hmm. What's lazy? Yeah. yeah, lazy thinking. You sent me that quote last night, which we can post in the show notes. It's, and it's a thoughtful piece is, is how many Christians are politically kind of milk toast yeah. or politically willfully ignorant because of just generations of indoctrination. If you're in this church body, this is how you vote. And this is your stance on war. And the, the argument of the, um, of the article was that uh, the church, churches have fallen down on their duty to address how theology intersects with politics. Right. right. And, th and that, it's a, that, that there's an overlap. And that means that uh, what we've done is we've actually left, like as pastors, we leave our mm -hmm. people unable to um, think theologically right. and, uh, in terms of the practicality of, say, a war right. or military service. I mean, that was it for me. It was like, I don't want to shoot a gun at a person. Sure. And that was as far as I could go. Yeah. And say, well, but wait a minute. What about defense of, you know, the weak? Mm -hmm. Does right. God have anything to say about that? Right. Well, yeah, he does, right? Right. Is um, that loving your neighbor? Yeah. For example. Yeah. What yeah, what does love of neighbor look like? I don't right. really think I was equipped to think about military service in a way that today I would mm -hmm. um I would I wouldn't necessarily encourage my children to pursue right. the vocation. Sure. Um or even for a short term. Um, right. But I wouldn't discourage them today in the way that I, I was just passively discouraged. Nobody told me, no, don't do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe my parents did. I don't remember. They'd have to remind me. Um, sure. But but I just had this like, oh, I don't know, just like an anti-violent. Um, I, th I thought that Christians were by nature anti, against violence in all cases. I, I think that's probably what I was taught. Sure. But no. were you raised in that kind of an environment where you weren't really exposed to the other side of the conversation? Well, of course I would. My parents were in the Peace Corps. <laughs> right. So, so yeah. as an example, uh, a guy I know online, he's actually running for political office in Pennsylvania, I think. His name's Sean Parnell. Okay. Some of you might be familiar with Sean. He's a vet uh, from Afghanistan. He wrote a book called Outlaw Pat Platoon. He's written a number of actually fiction books too. But anyways, in Outlaw Platoon, he, uh, he recounts his experience in Afghanistan. And he went over there for one set of reasons. And then once he got there, a lot of those uh, motivations changed. And like, actually very similar to you. He's a, a video game nerd, not mm -hmm. the military type, not a kind of raw, raw, God and country kind of thing. But how he ends up over there, read the book. It's a great book, actually. It's a quick read. But then when they're out on patrol, one of their patrols, uh, he, they find this boy on the road who's, uh, his eyes have been burned out and wow. his tongue has been cut out and he's naked and they see a village in the distance. So they assume this boy just wandered away from his village. They take him back to the village. His grandfather comes out. Yep, that's my grandson. His parents are dead. And then as they're, they're there and they're giving kind of medical supplies that they have, water that they have, and this is a very remote village. Yeah. They notice that there's other children that are in similar situations, and they find out that the Taliban routinely, and this has been going on for generations, go read the Kite Runner, actually, uh, the Taliban take their children and rape them and then cut out their eyes, burn out their eyes and cut out their tongues so they can't talk. And they knock out all their teeth for very disgusting, satanic sexual reasons. And right there, that was kind of the turn in his mission is, okay, let's say you're fighting for freedom. Let's say you're fighting for the Afghan people in a philosophical sense. Let's say you're fighting in a very real sense for your comrades in arms to your left and your right. Yeah. But then when you discover this is what they're doing to children and they're doing it on purpose and they do it because it's not only a cultural thing, but it's, it's, it gives them pleasure. And now all of a sudden it's personal. Yeah. And so is that love for neighbor then to go out and kill every single one of the people that did that to those children? Well, again, like I was talking about with Operation Toussaint and that documentary I watched over the weekend, I said to my wife, I'm like, if I walked into a, an orphanage in Haiti and I saw what they, they were prostituting orphans. Yeah. I'd shoot those two women in the face. And my wife just said, yeah, but you're not seeing the bigger picture. I'm like, no, I see the bigger picture. I just couldn't do it. 
at that moment. I couldn't, I would be too overwhelmed by that moment as a father, especially. Yeah. And is that loving your neighbor? Just shooting people because of their evil? Is it, is it justifiable to murder them? Well, that's the word, isn't it? Um, justifying yeah. your actions to, yeah. be, to say that these are, um, you know, just in the, in the, in the terms yeah. of the world right. um, or in terms of what's socially acceptable today. Right. But then well, there's I, also the whole other yeah. level of justice is like, you know, I, really asking that question, theological question, mm -hmm. um, what would God have me do? You know, right. What yeah. would he have me do in this situation? Would he have right. me allow this evil to continue because it's right. not my office, you know, to get right. involved? Right. Uh, or rather, would he say, you know what, you're going to put your neck on the line here mm -hmm. um, because this cannot yeah. stand. Yeah. Well, I think that comes right down to it too. And in, in terms of loving your neighbor, for me anyways, the way that I read that most simply is if there's going to, if someone's going to die today, it would be better if it was me. Because mm -hmm. that's the nature of, of unconditional love. It's the sacrificial nature of love. Because that's what Jesus says. Is it ever that it, simple, though? I mean, you, you have... For me, it is. You have multiple relationships, right? I, I mean, do. You have your, your wife and kids. Yep. You have your congregation. Who yep. are you responsible to? Yep. You know, and I know we talk, we've talked about this vocationally. Right. And practically speaking, your neighbor is near to you. Whoever's in front of you. Yeah, and, and to say, moment. well, you're not responsible for everybody in the entire world. Right. You, you can't be physically. No. The, then well, again, yeah. then again, if you're in that situation where, yeah, you're a half a world away and there's right. something in front of you, right. now that is your neighbor, right? Right. That's right well, there. I, I put it this way too, at least for myself, as far as an example, when, especially during the, the riots in July, or it is July still, wow. The beginning of July, the end of June with the George Floyd killing in the riots. And a lot of, not a lot, well, a lot of people were exposed for either like kind of latent racism or just they're blatantly racist. <laughs> And I had friends, I, I had people that I thought were my friends who said and did things. And I'm like, whoa, wait, what? And I just, I wasn't raised that way. And I was talking with my friend, Brittany, for the sake of this, you know, for the sake of this anecdote, she's a young black woman. She's a deacon, mm -hmm. deaconess. Um, and I just said, point blank, I'm like, it's pretty simple for me. I would die for you. Like I would sacrifice my life to save your life. It then has nothing to do with your skin color. It has to do with the fact that I love you. And I love you for the reasons that have nothing to do with your skin color. Primarily, you're my sister in Christ. And so if you're standing in front of me and someone was going to come and do you harm simply because of the color of your skin, yeah, I, it's not even a second thought to me. If someone's going to die today, it's going to be me, not you. Um, because that's what I prepared my life for. That's what I do. Yeah. And that's not what everybody's called to do. No. Like we were talking about with, with regards to just conversations you have in church with people maybe now is not the time to, to argue the point. Maybe the time right now is for compassion and forgiveness and long suffering and tenderness. And, and maybe there's another time where you're called to debate this point, but right now read the room. Right. <laughs> and there's a reason, you know, friends of mine in the veteran community, friends of mine in the first responder community who are both in service and out, that's their vocation. And a lot of them have felt a call since they were children. This is what I'm supposed to do with my life. Yeah. And they've been accused both directions before. They've been praised and they've been, they've been insulted and cursed. And we've had that conversation. Is, is what I did just? And my response is before God, no. Because <laughs> murder is murder. You will not murder. And you can read all the midrash you want, justifying <laughs> murder. Right. Murder is murder. It's very simple. It's you shall not murder. It's just a statement of fact. God's stating don't murder. And there's a reason. I'm the God of life. Mm -hmm. I'm the judge of life and death. And we're called not to murder. However, the world is a fallen and sinful creation. It's an evil, dark place. Satan is the ruler of this world. And there's going to come a time when we either all lay down and let evil kill all of us and do whatever it wants to us, or we stand up and say, no, not today, Satan. Yeah. I was thinking about... Um... A Facebook post that a family member sent to me and it was a mother kind of lamenting um, this COVID situation and, and there's kind of a, a warfare aspect to the way COVID's being at least treated right sure. um, and her over and over her refrain in this in this post is there are no good options there are no good options and and my reaction to it was um, actually there are good options there's just no perfect answer right, right? Right. And what it, what is the, I don't know who said it, right? Don't let perfect be the enemy of the good. Yeah. 
Yeah. You've quoted it before. Mm -hmm. Where'd it come from? I, I was trying to remember. I couldn't. Um, but regardless, I, you look at it and you're like, okay, you have to make a choice. Is it going to be, you know, cut, cut and dry, black and white, you know, moral perfection? Not in this life. Right. And I, I would argue not ever. I mean, you, you, but then you can't let that be the, what, the thing that brings paralysis, that you do nothing because you, right. you're so fearful of doing the wrong thing or do, not doing it well enough. It's like, mm -hmm. but you did nothing. Voltaire. <laughs> Is it Voltaire? Yeah, it's credited to Voltaire. Yeah, I don't like Voltaire, but I love okay. Voltaire. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't Indeed like his name. He's fantastic. He's, he's too, uh, it's just... I just maybe go. I'm a suspect. He's There's French. There's something French that I like. I like <laughs> Look at that! <laughs> I like Candide. It's a great story. I like the I, think I like it, the Bernstein. Uh, um, uh, what was it? Fanfare or whatever for the opera? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think what I see most often though is that the argument. It, there's an attempt to make the argument take place in the abstract. Yep. So, for example, in the training part of things, it's like, well, if you don't train, then you can't be ready to fight. If you don't know how to use a firearm. Then when it comes time to use a firearm, you'll end up shooting yourself or getting shot with your own firearm. If you don't know how to use a knife in a fight, you're probably going to have the knife turned on you and used against you. So that's why there's basic training in the military. You need to know the basics of how to use your weapon, ruck, do this, do that, basic military tactics, everything else. You're basically saying if you don't, uh, if you don't know how to use it, maybe you shouldn't even have it. <laughs> I am actually saying that 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If you own a, if you own a gun and you don't go to the, the range with that gun and train in that gun, please don't think that you know how to use that gun. Don't, mm. don't, don't. <laughs> you're, you're the most dangerous person in the house at that moment. So that being said, then to dig deep into this or deeper into this, most of Western civilization, actually, not just the church, but civilization in general, but the church in particular pro or con for just war, it comes from Augustine. Augustine mm -hmm. really was the first one who wrote extensively about just war, what we call just war theory, which was legitimated under the Roman Catholic Empire, the Holy Roman Empire. And for better or worse, was used to justify religious wars yeah. like the Crusades. But the, the Turks, as we call them, the Muslims actually, uh, they had just war theory. That's why Suleiman invaded Europe. That's the Jews have just war theory. That's why the Jews did what the Jews did. Well, I thought they were just generally murderous people all the time. Well, no, that's us. That's just everybody. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We just like labels. So I thought um, rather than go into Augustine in a specific sense, uh, I would expose all of you to something that I really like and have benefited from. And especially if you're interested in Augustine, there's a very big fat book that's actually not that expensive though. It's affordable. It's called Augustine Through the Ages, an encyclopedia, and it's edited by Alan D. Fitzgerald. Okay. And actually I'll, forwarded by Yaroslav Pelikan. All right. I'll link it in the show notes. And Alan Fitzgerald is, according to the book, professor of patristics at the Augustinian Patristic Institute in Rome and an editor of Augustinian Studies for Villanova University. So he and knows his stuff. Apparently. And this is an encyclopedia of what Augustine had to say on various topics. And that's why I recommend it. So a summary. Okay, good. Yeah. If you're not familiar with St. Augustine, maybe you know the Confessions, maybe the City of God, but you haven't dug deeper into his moral theology, for example, or you don't really know where can I go from Confessions? What, where do I go from here? And why Augustine? I, I, mean, yeah. I'm, I would say, well, if you think of a lot of their articulation on this topic, just where it comes later from uh, Aquinas, right? But he's... Yeah heavily dependent upon what Augustine yes. had said in yeah. like City Same of God. Same thing with Luther. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you and look Calvin. at Luther. Yeah. How much how much of Luther and Calvin is original to them or how much of it is Augustinian? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? I mean, and Luther will acknowledge that. He doesn't right. uh, dispute that at all. That's why our beloved professor Norman Nagel would say everything wrong with the Western church can be blamed on Augustine. And, and broadly speaking, all he's saying is most of Western Christianity or Christendom comes from Augustine in some way, shape, or form. Augustinianism was the most popular form of, of theology in the Middle Ages. Well, and that's partly because he wrote, right? So much. Like yes. Benedict didn't write that much. Yeah. So there's a Benedictine order. The Jesuits don't write much. Right. So they're not going to have that kind of influence. So in a sense, Augustine is kind of the theological version of a Plato or Aristotle. 
from the philosophical side of things, mm -hmm, right? Is that as Kant, Immanuel Kant said, all of Western philosophy is a footnote to Plato, because basically Western philosophy is just people responding or reacting to Plato or Aristotle, right? And part of the part of the I'd say appeal, but also um, you know the importance of Augustine is that um, he's not purely theological. No, 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 no. He's right. very Neoplatonic. Neoplatonic. So um, he, loves he Cicero. So he does have this, like we've been discussing, he has this way of in, having theology intersect with reality, with life. Very much so. Mm -hmm. He Well, for those of who don't know, he was a Manichaean before his conversion. And right. Manichaeanism is Neoplatonic. Neoplatonic meaning Plato, new Plato, Plato yeah, stuff. Yeah, kind of a new spin on the old stuff. So mm -hmm. Plato, but with a spin. And like I said, he, he loved Cicero. Augustine did. He had a very famous debate on the bondage of the will with a guy named Julian, Bishop of Eclanum. And they were both Ciceronian and both Neoplatonists. And when you read that argument, if you know the philosophy, most of the argument's more philosophical than theological. Mm -hmm. right. And uh, for Plato, um, people were basically wild animals. And that's why we need the law. And so Plato's position ethics, ethically was we need a star chamber. We need a, a kind of round table of, of intellectual elites, so to speak, who are trained from birth to run a polis, a city. And because without laws, without this, this star chamber of people who are taught to rule, people cut loose from the, the laws are just wild animals. We're going to devour each other. Aristotle had a much more optimistic view of humanity. Yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking, it sounds like the Plato vision is like uh, Dr. Strangelove, the war room, right? It, it kind of is, actually, I mean, <laughs> in an absurdist, satirical sense. Right. That's why, like with the Manichaeans then, Manichaeans thought that the flesh was evil, that mm -hmm. everything material is evil, and that all of life is striving towards the escape of what is material to become spiritual. Whereas Plato was striving for the ultimate, like, version of humanity. Yeah, the yeah. essence, the essential thing. Mm-hmm. And we hear this to this day when people talk about authenticity, being your authentic <laughs> self. That's what they're all, they're aping Plato. They're just basically saying like, what makes me, me? And how do I get to that person? The best I... version of yourself. Yeah, exactly. In fact, the language of journey is platonic. It's straight Plato, Neoplatonism. So when like, I was just listening to a abuse uh, survivor this morning, talk about her spiritual journey to recovery. That's Plato. Because moving talking, from yeah. lower to higher form exactly like okay. how do i escape my physical form so that i can be mindful and be spiritual and separate myself from my body so i can be reflective and yeah. achieve what it you know find the real me that was dest destroyed and damaged by these people but plato, plato wasn't wasn't gnostic i mean he didn't deny no, bodily but the reality were platonic <laughs> yeah. this is where it gets tricky yeah so when we when you read augustine specifically and this is why i like the encyclopedia if you're not familiar with neoplatonic philosophy and the neoplatonics that preceded augustine like a guy plotinus for example mm -hmm. very famous first century neoplatonic philosopher who a lot of christians read a lot of christians were very familiar with plotinus actually i think paul might reference him and so Augustine's very familiar with that. He grew up kind of being educated in that. So when Augustine converts to Christianity, his early stuff is very philosophical, kind of like with Luther's early Psalms lectures being very sure. Roman Catholic. Yeah. And then later, as he, he finds his way, he untangles himself from his training, from what he was indoctrinated in, nominalism, the Via Moderna, uh, Neoplatonic Augustinian thought. He, he separates himself from that slowly but surely. But I would argue you can never actually be free of it because it's the Western philosophical tradition. It's well, you look at it. I mean, Plato, or excuse me, uh, Augustine is 5th century. Is that right? 300s. 300s, so 4th century. 300s through the 4th. And then we're talking about Luther and this being the predominant way of thinking at the time of Luther, which is 1,200 years later. Right. And, and, and that whole like, oh, the Dark Ages in between and there was no scholarly learning or something is kind of a fallacy, I think. But... Yeah, it, it, yeah, there there is like a predominant school of thought, and it holds. Yeah, yeah. you know, and Luther doesn't even really, you know, throw it off. He just uh, right. tweaks it. He converted to bat, to Christianity in three eighty six. Yeah, so four born three fifty four, approximately died four thirty. So yeah, the overlap there. 
which yeah. is, by the way, we've talked about this, but Calvin likes, he prefers the older Augustine. Roman Catholicism prefers the early to middle aged, kind of the Pelagian controversies era Augustine. Augustine changed a lot. Yeah, so you I read City like of Pro, God. That's probably yeah. the most helpful book to, to kind of get that because it's written over, what, 20 years or so. Yeah, yeah. And you, and you and can it's... see the Platonism there when he talks about the heavenly versus the earthly. Mm -hmm. and right. How he deals with the gods and false gods. But also to the point today, Augustine used the military might of Rome to put down the Donatists in mm. North Africa. <laughs> so the way that he dealt with the doctrinal issue was to have them arrested and or murdered. I'm sorry, arrested and or killed for sedition. Yeah. <laughs> and legal. Uh, then that's really the beginning of, or well, that's coming out of Constantine, right? But yeah, you know, the, uh, the idea that church and state are kind of this inseparable and we, they can use each other mm -hmm. basically. The king's two bodies. Yeah. Which I've talked about before. The king is the, the physical embodiment of both heavenly and earthly kingdoms. Yeah. He has two swords. Exactly. So this is from section W of the encyclopedia on war. And I think this is specifically having to deal with the barbarian invasions, the Goths, the Visigoths, any other, the goth kids at the mall. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All the different goths that invaded Rome. Right. They're all wearing black eyeshadow. Yes. They were all wearing black eyeshadow and listened to the cure. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine? I was like, how are you going to do warfare oh, with this? You right. might hit us over the head with your skateboard or something, but that's we're about a it. Close hot topic. <laughs> <laughs> Go home, kids. <laughs> so, barbarian invasions, church and state, the fall of Rome. So, war. Nowhere are the paradoxes of Augustine's thought more obvious than in his attitudes towards warfare. So there you go, from the very beginning. Paradox. You know, Fitzgerald points this out. There's a paradox. There's a dichotomy here. It is ironic that he is often seen as a theologian of war. For he has more, he was more a theologian of, of peace. No stranger to violence, he hated war, but saw it as a consequence of sin that gave rise to many lusts. Okay. We've talked about this. Let's review. For Augustine, original sin is concupiscence. Uh -huh. it's, yep. it's misordered love. It's lust versus agape. Mm -hmm. Again, that's a platonic philosophical position. There's four kinds of love in Greek philosophy that we forget about, the fourth one all the time. There's agape, eros, philia, and storge. Storge is the love that I have for my favorite sports team. Like if in, in Britain, for example, yeah, your favorite football team, like Chelsea or something, or Manchester United. I own the scarf, yes. That kind of love. The kind of love that I'm going to burn down your house and beat up your wife and kids because you root for the other team. That kind of love for a sports team. I live in, you know, two hours you're from a, Green you're Bay. In Packers country, yeah. Yeah, I understand. Packers Bears, right? It's the, so you have agape unconditional, limitless love. You have philia, familial love, the love of brother for brother. Also filial love, Philadelphia love can be applied to soldiers. Mm -hmm. For example, right. again, the, the love of comrades. comrades in arms. Right. Then you have eros, erotic love. That would be lusty love. And then you have storge, the love for, I would say like, it's the love of a common endeavor, a common challenge, like love for a sports team, love for your favorite band. You know how we do this. You argue for your favorite band and then someone's like, oh, I hate that band. I love this band and they're posers, that kind of thing. Yeah. That's story game. And, and love is one word, but I, I think also they use the word passion, right? Passion has seven meanings according to Jacques Derrida in Western oh, good night. literature. There's seven. Yeah. It's, actually, that's a really great book. As a complete aside, Jacques Derrida, he's a deconstructionist. Most of what he said is completely unfathomable. And I can <laughs> say that because I've read 12 of his books. Good but for you. Is, uh, is it? It's like, I was just you, trying to you, prove a point. You, you need like a, a badge of honor for that. Insecurity. <laughs> that's, that's right there. I have to be smarter than everybody else. Um, so I'll just read Jacques Derrida and parrot him and pretend I understand that the refrigerator is not really there. But his, his book on passion, Stephen Paulson, actually, ironically, he had his class for crucifixion and resurrection read excerpts from Jacques Derrida on passion to explain the Western understanding of Christ's passion. Hmm. Because the passion as it's depicted in the New Testament and the Greek understanding of passion is different than throughout the centuries than literary definitions of passion. And Derrida was actually reflecting on that very point, on Jesus's crucifixion and the passion of Christ versus literary definitions of passion and how we've changed then the definition of Christ's passion over time hmm. and what it means to suffer 
for one's passion wow. versus suffering over like romantic love. So Derrida will talk about like Romeo and Juliet, for example, and like Jesus didn't die because of unrequited love like Romeo and Juliet or something. Right, like right. It's a really interesting book, actually. It's very short. You can probably read it in a weekend. So but is this, uh, I'm trying to think of what, I mean, what work would it be from Derrida that we should be pointing towards here? It's literally called Passion on Passion. Well, I found it in French. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> well, I have it, I have it in a reader. <laughs> oh, so maybe that's what I should look for. Okay. I have a link no, something I mean, up. Like Paulson got it from somewhere and I have it in a reader of collection of oh, I gotcha. copies. Because I had a copy, I had my professor's copy card so I could go to the copy center whenever I felt like and have copies made for myself. Nice. On his dime. Thank you, Gymnastic and Stephen Paulson. Another rule they changed at the seminary after I graduated because mm. I abused the privilege. I was going to say, yeah, that's your fault. Oh, and one other person <clears throat> who will remain innocent <laughs> by not being named. But anyways, that's what he means by lust then. Like when Augustine talks about lust, he means concupiscence, original sin. You and I as Lutherans say, no, that's second table of law stuff. When we talk about concupiscence, we mean faith, bad faith. So for Augustine, agape is godly love. Eros is concupiscence, erotic love. That's original mm -hmm. sin. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason why for Augustine, like sexual intimacy is always yeah. like the manifestation of sin, basically. Which has absolutely nothing to do with his personal relationship. Oh, no, of course not. <laughs> that didn't affect him at all. No. All theology is autobiographical at a certain point. His writings betray no glorification of war, but offer many laments about its cruelty. It was better to kill war with words than human beings with the sword. And there's references then in the parentheses here so that you can go to the front of the book, you can look up what that abbreviation means, and then you can mm -hmm. go run down the, the source yourself. Yet for Augustine, warfare was sometimes a sad duty waged to restore peace. That's actually from the city of God. The real evils were not war itself, but the love of violence, the bloodlust, the libido dominandi, or lust for rule, which it occasioned. And we we're just talking about that in regards to Jocko Willink. And mm -hmm, we talked right. about him addressing his men of his platoon, that there's at least one guy in here who is here just because he loves to kill things. He loves yeah, he's to kill a masochist. People. Or not he's a masochist, a, masochist, yeah, a sadist. Yeah, sadist. Sadist, yeah. yeah. And that war is going to attract sadists in the same way that the church is going to attract sexual predators. Because mm. you look at a group of people and you say, there are people in the world who just, again, they just look at a group of people and go, what benefit is this group of people to me? Mm. It's a wolf looking at sheep. Mm -hmm. And the church is a, very, is a place where, again, because we tend to have a high anthropology in the church, we assume people are good. We're very welcoming of people. We're very welcoming of everybody. We want everybody to be happy here. But we do it, tend to attract people who have been abused in various predatory. ways. That too, exactly. And, and not just in the predatory sense, but in the very passive aggressive sense, you were abused. Maybe you're engaged in abuse to this day. And this is a great, you know, pen for you to mingle with all these other sheep and abuse them too. Yeah. I've seen this with alcoholism and I've seen people in recovery who found their way back into the church and then were preyed upon because of their addictions mm -hmm. in a very similar right. sense or preyed upon others. Because as I say, and this is something that is, is covered in recovery. If you put me in a room with a hundred people, I will find the addict in the room immediately. I don't know if it's a pheromone we give off, but it's like mm -hmm. a something. Light. Yeah. It's if, something. If you put me in a room with people, I will find the messed up, addict in that room right away they find you too by the way and they find yeah you've been in the room you've been there you've seen it <laughs> it's like how did they know um so for augustine then yeah you're you're gonna find people who are attracted to war even christians mm -hmm. who are going to be attracted to warfare because of a lust for maybe not like i wouldn't translate this as rule so much as domination yeah like dominande, yeah, authority, rule, but really to dominate another person. Right, right. Well, in that same interview um, that, or where they were talking about Iraq with uh, Jocko, he was talking about uh, what's the massacre where... Me lie. Yeah, me lie. And all it took was a, a higher authority just to mm -hmm. say, cut it out. And they yeah. stopped. These yeah, people stopped. who were who were like yeah. just murdering, really. And, it, that, and he wasn't even there in person. He radioed it in, knock it off. And then the guy on the radio was like, he's telling us we need to stop. And they just, they stopped. And they just stopped. And you're like, wait a minute. Right. 
like how did you get so caught up in yeah. everything going around you mm -hmm. you know but it's like a, a switch was flipped it is and we talk about this in fighting all the time about controlling your emotions because one if you lose control of your emotions in a fight you're probably going to get knocked out and defeated because you're not thinking but also there's that that that's what comes out is this lust to dominate your opponent to become and a maniac over. yeah yeah and uh, there's rules in every in every professional or amateur fight when you enter into that there's a rule set that you need to learn and be aware of so when you're in a fight like i was in a i was in a tournament and i was watching a match and one guy bit another guy on his leg like in that no. he literally just lost control of himself in the moment because he was being defeated he bit this guy and this was a high level um fighter he wasn't an amateur he wasn't a beginner he was high level he'd been in the game for at least seven years competing and he just wow. reached out grabbed the guy and bit his calf and like bit bit like left marks and everyone just you know we all just like what did you just do and then he you could see in his eyes he realized what he had done so then he tried to justify what he did which made it worse yeah it does but the point is like there's rules and you you are always on the edge but you never go over the edge and that's a more benign sense of like, yeah, you could get injured, you could get knocked out. But in a situation like in a, where Augustine's saying, you're, you have a sword or you have a gun in the modern sense, when you cross that line, like I talked about with Outlaw Platoon and Sean Parnell's accounts, when you cross the line from we're going to do this, but we're going to do it right and we're going to take the moral high ground on this and we're not going to like walk around cutting off people's hands and heads yeah, and putting them on yeah. pikes. Even though in, he talks about this from a leadership position, a lot of the guys in his platoon at that moment when they saw this boy and they found out what happened to him, that's their attitude. Like, we're going to go out right now and we're going to murder everybody who had anything to do with this. We're going to murder people if they deny that they're, because they're so emotional. Yeah. And he recognizes as a leader in that moment, I can't allow myself to get down at the level of my soldiers. I have to maintain the moral high ground. I thought I of the word mind. I couldn't think of. Uh, it's berserker, right? Yeah, berserker mode. Yep. Right, where you ju really just lose it, totally lose Which it. Which for the Vikings, they're like, yeah, it's kind of, we have one guy that does that. We let him go first. And he was also completely jacked out of his mind on drugs. Uh, that helps, yeah. It helps. But, you know, same thing. Like, even the Vikings were smart enough to know, like, we let the berserkers go first. <laughs> they soften everybody up. If you them. like using Augustine's word, those who have a love for violence, bloodlust. Exactly. And exactly. to dominate, yes. Or the kamikazes in World War II in the, in the Pacific Theater is like, yeah, same thing. They were hopped up on methamphetamines and stuff, but they're specifically chosen. And you need someone to stand up and say, this is the line. And like Jocko says, there's a line and we don't cross that line. And mm -hmm. my responsibility as your leader is to say, no, we don't cross that line. Right, right. And for Augustine, warfare is sometimes like in sad duty waged to restore peace and there's real evil involved with this violence and the the temptation then is to sit in the direction of well now that i've defeated you i'm going to defeat your family your neighborhood your nation i'm not going to leave a single stone on top of another stone which was the roman way of waging war and so obviously augustine being familiar because he's an expatriate he grew mm -hmm. up in north africa He's familiar with this technique. He he knows about Carthage. It's right down the road from where he grew up at. Yep. So he's saying war should only be fought in the face of, like you talked about, you mentioned, overwhelming evil. Mm -hmm. But not just because we're bored and it's summer. <laughs> that, that's uh, that's in the scriptures, right? It was yeah. the springtime when when the, the, they would go out to war. That's exactly. what David with Bathsheba yeah so it's like what you go to sense, war in the spring oh, yeah it's just what you do <laughs> what we're always watching out for then is the bloodlust mm -hmm. the the lust to dominate another human being and just love of violence well it's like I talk about again going back to the example if I beat you in a fight and then I put my like I put my foot on your head and like grind my foot into your face while you're down on the mat mm. that's a person who has bloodlust that's a person who lusts after domination it's not enough that I defeat you. It's that I have to demean you as a human being. I have to dehumanize you in that moment and let you know you're not the same as me. Well, and the problem with, with that word lust or libido here in Latin is that there, it, there's no limit to it. No. no right? No so like you're saying, there's a line that we don't cross. Well, yeah. once it becomes lust, you're, you are, yeah. it's never going to be enough to just beat somebody up. No, there's not. And especially in war, and it's something that we never want to talk about, and I'm not going to get into it, but that's why sodomy is a very 
normal practice historically. When you mm-hmm. defeat another soldier, you don't just defeat them. You treat them like a woman. And it has nothing to do with sexual orientation. You, you are diminishing them in that hierarchy, that social hierarchy, by saying you're not a man. You're not mm-hmm. a warrior. You're a woman. That's not so enough that we've defeated you. We have to humiliate yeah. you. Humiliate you, exactly. Mm-hmm. It's, and that's, that's the warrior culture at that time, too. Like you said, there was no, that was the line. It was on the other side of that. Isn't that something? Yeah. So Augustine's views were based on his interpretation of the Bible, especially though, and by the way, just an aside, then, so we're talking about it. Think about being a Christian then in that society at that time where that's a normal practice. Like, the, like people don't look at you and go, oh, you should be ashamed of yourself for what you just did. <laughs> Instead, people are like, what, you, you just let them go? Yeah, but probably the warriors, when they're walking down the street, you, you go on the other side of the street. There is that part too. Yeah. <laughs> but just think about that then, that being a Christian at that time, and let's say you are engaged in civil disobedience, or you're, you're speaking out against Rome and the Roman legions and their constant warfare and maintaining the empire. Think of what, what you risk as a Christian, as a member of this new religious sect of yeah. Judaism. Yeah. And to be Augustine at this time where you're a bishop, you have a lot of, of, of not only ecclesial power and authority, but you have a lot of social power and authority. He crushed the Donatist, this North African church body. He crushed them with the military. There were no consequences for him other than he lost popularity amongst the civilian population. Sure, yeah. But he wasn't put on trial for war crimes. No, they didn't even have that concept. No, exactly. Because he's a Roman citizen. (laughs) Augustine's views were based on his interpretation of the Bible, especially the OT. To many of his contemporaries, including the Manichaeans, which we mentioned, war appeared to contradict the pacific precepts of the New Testament. And I think this really gets... Yeah, I think this really gets to the heart of it. And maybe we're going to, have to spend multiple episodes on this because I think this is a really like pregnant conversation that, to have. And I'm really enjoying this. I hope you are. But when I talk about this stuff, I always quote the Old Testament and then allude to the Gospels. The people that argue against me always quote the, quote New, the Testament, New Testament and rarely, and if they allude to the Old Testament, it is the prophets usually. And, or it's in a negative sense. Or it's in a negative sense. Exactly. So that's really astute to bring that out. So even I'm not aware of it, there it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm still a part of this Western theological tradition stemming from Augustine where, oh, well, if you're pro, you're probably going to be an Old Testament kind of guy. If you're anti, you're probably going to appeal to the New Testament. Well, and is it because that we, we address, um, you know, our spiritual well-being, our spiritual health, and our physical well-being or health in kind of a flattened sense, like as if they're one and the same? Yeah. You know, yeah, and, and, yeah. and the New Testament isn't always addressing, you know, how you, um, you know, how you would serve as a soldier, for example. Yeah. As a matter of fact, Jesus doesn't tell like the centurion, hey, cut it out. Say, yeah, there's lots of soldiers in the New Testament. Right. He, he, he uses them, of course. They bring about his own death. Mm-hmm. Um, but he doesn't tell them to leave that. He tells the rich people to leave their <laughs> richness. But he didn't tell, yeah. tell the soldiers to leave their soldiering, which is interesting. So as pacifist as the New Testament could be read, um, or, well, I see it usually is. Yeah. Um, that's an interesting idea that I hadn't really probably addressed before or thought yeah, of. Yeah, it is. It, you know, we address this as, a, as a, com, a side example. We address this in relation to polygamy and monogamy. Mm-hmm. Jesus says, husband of one wife. And yet we have polygamy in the Old Testament. So we'll try and interpret that according to the oh, context yeah. of the ancient Near Eastern people who practice polygamy. including Jesus, ha- Jesus comes and brings a better way. Right. Is that Jesus is like, yeah, no, that's not the intent. That's not the natural law. And we go back to Genesis mm-hmm. versus war. It's kind of just commonly accepted throughout the entirety of the Bible that there will be war and not just earthly war, spiritual war. Right. Well, that's the other aspect too, is the New Testament, Jesus isn't terribly passive when it comes to spiritual warfare. <laughs> Nor are the apostles or, or, or the prophets. Yeah. Or the Which prophets. Yeah. It's an interesting point too, then that we tend to talk, like you said, we'll talk about spiritual warfare in an abstract sense. We'll talk about earthly warfare, depending on how close it is to us as far as home and family, in an abstract sense, and kind of flatten that, like you pointed out. Mm -hmm. But I think, too, now that we're talking about it, I think it just kind of makes us uncomfortable to recognize that maybe war is just a part of creation. Violence and conflict is just a part of creation. It's a part not only of the fall, but it's a part of creation. Violence is a part of the creation. 
because mm. death and new life is a part of creation. Hmm. Light and versus God very dark. Clearly and, says that the yeah. fruit, you know, again, the 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 seed bearing fruit will fall to the ground and bear fruit. And whatever that meant before Genesis three, after Genesis three, an orange has to fall to the ground and rot and die for an orange yeah. tree to grow. I don't know if we would say it, it was a case before the fall into sin, but certainly mm -hmm. that's what the fall set up. Right. No, and I'm not implying that God, but like that would make actually that would make God like Marduk or something like yeah, God right. of war. And yet the most used metaphor for God in the Old Testament is warrior. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, you have, you know, uh, Adam and Eve choosing a side. Yeah. So, I mean, they set, they set up the battle. They set up the warfare. Yeah. And you can blame it on the devil if you want. Um, <laughs> God he doesn't. Just, again, he just points at the door. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they choose to make God their enemy. Right. Yeah. That's kind and, of Paul's point, right? Is that he, right, mm -hmm. while we were enemies of God, he reconciled us. Mm -hmm. No, and God, God, yeah, is he passive in his um, redemption of people? Um, right. Yeah, well, no, he suffers everything, even death for us. Right. Which in the Middle Ages was a very common motif in Christian art that Jesus is the the bait on the hook, mm, right? And and the devil swallows him on the cross. The cross is that hook. So the imagery in the Middle Ages of again the suffering and passion of Jesus, suffering and passion the same word. The passion of Jesus is militaristic. Jesus goes into hell. He overthrows the devil and all of his minions. He crashes through the gates of hell. He frees the prisoners and leads them out in his train. It's very militaristic imagery. Mm -hmm. And we have uh, mighty fortresses are God. Sure. Same thing, very militaristic imagery from Luther. It isn't really until the Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution that we see a change in the hymnody of the church. We talked about this when we talked about you know, judging a hymn. The hymnody changed. And yeah. we went from God and warlike imagery to God and shepherd pastoral imagery. Very soft gentle, language. Very soft language, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's why I argue that modern piety is so soft because we shifted our focus away from militaristic imagery and, and the language of conflict and battle to the language of being sheep and being led and being innocent little lambs. I except even the, lamb. even the sheep uh, illustration is like, well, yeah, except there's wolves. Yeah, there's wolves and the shepherd is called to Defend, the, wolf, and, defend the, yeah. the, the sheep. Mm -hmm. And it's not, again, it's not flat. It's not one or the other. It's that, that, that symbol, the dichotomy of God is a warrior shepherd because that's actually what shepherds were to the yeah. present tense. Yeah, in, sure. In areas of the world where there's still shepherds, they are called to defend the flock against bears and wolves. And well, lions. even here, I mean, coyotes are real, right? You know yeah, that. Absolutely. Yeah. You see them out back. <laughs> but the, yeah, this, this, we set up, I think, this false dichotomy between the Old and New Testaments. Mm. And say, well, the Old Testament's very bloody, and, and this is Manichaean, actually. Yes, it is. The God of the Old Testament versus the God, again, the hippie God of the New Testament. <laughs> hey, man, just love each other. I mean, come on. Versus the God of the Old Testament, who's like, if you, you did you just cross? Okay, I'm going to kill you. Like, I'm going to kill you because yeah. you crossed that line. Yeah. Or rebellion kind of God. No do-overs. No. Yep, exactly. Versus Jesus is God. Jesus is the word of God. Jesus is Torah. You're, when God speaks, that's Jesus. So what are you going to do? Just ignore that? Maybe, maybe we'd say it this way, that the, with Jesus... What do you think the angel of death is? Uh-huh. Well, we'll leave our listeners to answer that question. <laughs> um, no, Jesus shifts the battlefield. Correct. You know, the, the battle still is going on, but he, he, right. he shows how, um, you know, just like with marriage, the, the earthly marriages are a type or shadow of the, mm -hmm. of the heavenly marriage. Well, then right. you have the same thing. There's a... There's a earthly battles that happened. Right. Um, and these are, these are just, what do you want to say? Manifestations of the, of the real spiritual battle that's going yeah, on. Like the psalmist points out, if, who can praise you from Sheol? Mm, right. If I'm dead, how can I praise you? Therefore, according to your word, save me from my enemies. I mean, I don't, maybe it's too much to say, but all earthly warfare, the goal is to undermine the faith. Right. Just like Satan's attempt with Eve is to undermine procreation and their sure. creation. Yeah. If Eve's dead, there's no womb to bear fruit. So, right. No people. No. Period. Yeah. If if I murder everybody over there who's a Christian, no more gospel. Yeah, and we we don't like to talk about it too much um because it's I guess not politically correct today, but sure. then, you know, who are some of the primary targets um for, you know, mm -hmm. for despots or, you know, yeah. um uh, especially under more Check recently, the Rwanda genocide. I was going to say under communism, or as well, you see that yeah. too. Who gets targeted in China today? 
Yeah. Christians. Primarily it's Christians. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Except the state approved Christians. <laughs> Same thing in every despotic country. The approved church is allowed to function and they can say, look, we allow Christianity to thrive in this country. Meanwhile, over here in the prison camps. <laughs> well, and part of that is, again, the re it's a reality that we don't do here in the States in particular, um, no, but that they do there. Get savvy pretty quick. Those, those Christians mm -hmm. uh, under, you know, communist China, they speak out against it to their people. Right. Right. Maybe not as publicly, but the Chinese government knows it. Right. They know that they're, these are not people who approve of their rule. Right. Uh, so the, these are Christians who are interacting mm -hmm. with politics in a very right. moral, you know, religious right. moral sense. Well, when I call out my governor or friends of ours call out their governors for saying, nope, churches can't reopen mm -hmm. because this only has a 99.9% .9 recovery rate. Well, that's in Europe. Uh, in the States, what is it? 99.4? But we don't I'm have to sorry. talk about why. No, I overshot that one. 99.4 <laughs> in the States. And you call out your political leader and go, okay, so the church can't reopen, but I can go tear down statues mm -hmm. and not get COVID. Well, that's outside, by the way. Right. Right, sure. Mm -hmm. So I can have church outside. Well, no, we, no, you can't actually. No, no. Uh, and like I'm saying, that's not now. I we've crossed over. That's not a political debate anymore. That's not a medical debate. Now you're saying that okay, you can't receive the gospel of Jesus Christ specifically. No. Yeah. Well, but, yeah, just but just for a while. How are you going to be received if you call that out as as demonic? Or like you're saying you're saying that that well, your the governor first is weeks. possessed by the. <laughs> by it by an evil spirit i'm like yeah yeah do they have to acknowledge that do they have to know that do they have to even have to believe in it no they don't but that doesn't mean it it isn't right i mean well this goes to the point of satanic agency mm -hmm. we're talking about this is if i point at adolf hitler the great boogeyman of the 20th century and i said he's satanic sure absolutely or stalin or pol pot or mao tse tung or shang kai shek whoever they're satanic uh my governor is satanic Wait, 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 wait. He's just a normal guy. What are you saying? He's not yeah. full pot. He's not murdering people. I'm like, you're right. He's not murdering. Well, he's not murdering people. He's simply murdering their faith. Mm -hmm. Attempting to murder their faith. Mm -hmm. As an Why? agent. Because he, want, he wants fear, love, and trust in him. Exactly. The state can save you. The church can't. Which is halfway true. Yeah. Oh, wait, no, it's not at all. Actually, the state can't save you. Your immune system can. Doctors can. Certain vaccinations can. Certain they can treatments. aid in that. They can aid in that. They can aid in that. That's kind of their job mm -hmm. is to facilitate and, you know, make it, make the way straight for those resources to be available. But this is why in this country, at least, and this is why Luther writes about the two kingdoms, we have to be careful about turning the state or a leader into a God, because let's say that leader is in a more abstract sense, um, Constantine mm -hmm. yeah. or Charlemagne. And your leader says that it is our Christian duty to da, da, go da, down da. south <laughs> and kill all these godless Turks who have taken over the Holy Land. Again, you don't have the internet or social media. There's no conspiracy theorist running around saying, I think there's an ulterior motive. I think he just wants the gold. Well, he, and he did promise you land when you get there. So. And he did promise you land even along the way. Whatever you get, it's yours. Now, imagine if that were the case today, that the GI Bill was, well, if you go to Afghanistan, whatever territory you take is yours now to keep. You want a ranch? You can have a ranch. Exactly. On the surface, it may be a very appealing, especially if the leader is appealing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But like Augustine warns us, warfare is sometimes necessary, but it should be always, in my opinion, and going with him, it should always be a sad vocation, a sad duty. And wage to restore peace. Don't make me do this. Mm -hmm. This is why I tell people all the time, People that want to get in fights, people that go out looking for a fight are the weakest people you will meet because they do not comprehend the nature and consequences of violence. Mm -hmm. a person it's, not, it's not constructive. No, no, it's terrible. Yeah. But if you're aware of what the consequences of violence and you're aware of all the variables, you seek, at, it, it's like the old saying, better to be a warrior in a garden than a gardener in a war. Hmm. I would, that's the, and we talked about, that's the definition of meekness, knowing yeah. how to use your sword, but choosing to keep it sheathed, not for yourself, but for your neighbor. Mm -hmm. That's why right. Peter, when he cuts off Malthus's servant's ear, is the antithesis of what Jesus says at the beginning of the gospel. It's like, that would okay, be an unjust war right there. That would be terribly unjust because ultimately Peter, whom Jesus has already called Satan once, is kind enough not to say, hey, 
I thought we sorted this out on the road up here. I have to do this according to scripture. That's the way this works. And you're getting in the way of scripture. So not only are you physically like hurting your neighbor in an earthly sense when it's not necessary, you're interfering with the salvation of the universe. Right. Right. Malchus doesn't even know what he's doing. Right. And think about it from that perspective. If I go out looking for a fight and I bump in you on the street, so I just shoot you in the chest. Even if I am quote unquote justified and I'm not going to go to court, I'm not going to be tried. I'm, I'm just, I'm justified. You can never hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mm -mm. No, that's it. I just stopped you from any possibility that you have of ever hearing the gospel. That's why I tell people don't, we don't need to do this. We don't. Well, you, you and I've had this uh, happen where in a sense, we, there's like, well, not a sense. No, it is. It's actual spiritual warfare happening within the, the congregation. Oh, and, absolutely. And you have to use almost violent, but at least aggressive words to address mm -hmm. it because of just the, the, mm -hmm. the ban banal evil of it. Yeah. Right. And if it's allowed to persist and fester, you know, it could undermine yeah. everything. <clears throat> I um, was accused it, 10 years ago of saying that someone was Satan. And I said, no, I never said he was Satan. I said he was an agent of Satan. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And, and yeah. when you address that, um, it, I, I don't know. I mean, it's always been, well, I shouldn't say it's always, but it, it's usually been good for the congregation on a whole, but it's been entirely destructive for that person. Right. Yeah, and it's like, always, it's almost like last resort. You just, it was, yeah. You, you don't want to be put in that, painted into that corner where you le legitimately just have to say to someone, this yeah. congregation is not for you. This altar yeah. is not for you. I think in, in our case, because it was a, a matter of church discipline, we ended up excommunicating and banning the person. Mm -hmm. um, literally from the premises, not just from the rail, but from the premises. It was like I dropped a grenade at my feet and he and I got hit by the grenade explosion and everybody else was like 20 feet away. Yeah. We got shrapnel bits and right. they all healed. Right, but and you're maimed. For, <laughs> but they didn't forget the explosion. Mm -hmm. Whereas, uh -huh. yeah, I walked away maimed. He walked away maimed. And it was actually only recently that we, because of a, a death, we had to interact with each other and mm. because I was emotionally distant enough from it, I was the one who took the place of the weaker brother yeah, and treated him with love and respect and deferred to him to let him know whatever happened in the past between us is in the past. As far as I'm concerned, it doesn't exist anymore. That being said, you're not coming back. <laughs> yeah, I know. Cause it's, it's a personality thing and it's too destructive and what happened happened. And, you know, I've, I've dealt with this with divorces, for example. Sure. Same Whereas story. Two people got divorced and then three years later they got remarried. I'm like, really? Really? <laughs> like, no, we, we worked it out. I'm like, mm. for those of us on the outside looking in, I don't think this is a good decision. This is mutually assured destruction. Yeah. Right. Exactly. It's like, you just miss the drama. You miss the misery. <laughs> and, and, yes. Well, and, and then again, that's that lust for, um, for yeah. violence. I mean, they actually really en yeah. enjoyed the pain. Yeah. No, I've, and as an alcoholic and an addict and as someone who grew up you know, being abused and my wife too, we're hyper aware of this all the time. It's something mm -hmm. that we're always working on even 22 years after we've been married is people who are abused tend toward abuse of others or self-abuse. Mm -hmm. So you get divorced, you find somebody else who's going to abuse you in a little bit of a, a different way, but still abuse. And you keep getting in these relationships and you come to me and say, pastor, I just don't understand why I keep getting in these bad relationships. Hmm. Well, I'm like, well, maybe it's not the men in the relationship. Maybe it's who, again, like I said, you're in the room, there's a hundred guys in the room and you seek out the one guy who's abusive or an alcoholic or whatever it may right. be. Right. And like we said, he can identify you too. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. That's how my wife and I found each other. Hmm. And we can laugh at each other about it today. <laughs> yeah. The first 11 years of counseling and, and all that stuff, you know, it's fine. Like you said, it's violent hmm. and it either makes you stronger and the Lord uses that to bind you together right? stronger or it just, yeah, it, 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 it's like, you're like Humpty Dumpty. So in Moses's wars, Augustine saw just and righteous retribution that restrained sinners from further evil, thus acting against their will, but in their own best interest. When done without revenge or pleasure, punishment of evildoers was an act of love. There it is. Mm-hmm. The precept, resist not evil from Matthew 5, did not prohibit wars. For malice, not military service, was the real danger. Yeah. There it is. So it has to do with the heart. Yep. Okay. And, and lastly, for these two episodes, or however you decide to chop them up, I think this is an important end piece because this is what always comes around behind this is, yep. well, what about, and here it comes. The command to turn the other cheek from Luke 6 
referred to the intention rather than the deed. Patience and benevolence did not always conflict with inflicting physical punishment. For when Moses killed sinners, he was motivated by charity, not cruelty. Hmm. That's Love not a popular one. opinion right no. there. Love for one's enemies did not prevent a benevolent severity toward them. His hmm. distinction between intention and act enabled him to claim that war did not conflict with the Bible. So any hostile act was justifiable, provided it was motivated by charity. The Pacific precepts were transformed to that love of neighbors could legitimate their deaths and not to resist evil became an inward attitude compatible with outward belligerence. Hmm. For example, in a more benign sense, as I'm reading this, I'm thinking uh, parents used to spank their kids. Yeah, that's right. Uh, some parents, like mine, beat the living hell out of me. Hmm. It started as a spanking and quickly escalated. Now, was that a charitable act? No, it was not. Can was it, it be? Can it be? I would argue yes. Yeah. In fact, I would argue we have an entire generation of kids who got timeouts and participation trophies tearing down statues and burning down their cities right now. Yeah, but and that was some opinion. of the best wisdom that we ever got was to say, look, if you're angry, don't do it. Right. No, yeah. there's no physical discipline. If you're, if you're time. angry, yeah. Yeah, that's right. If it's done impulsively too, right? right? You know, rather than that, um, if it's like, look, the child is not responding to any other, right? anything else, right. it, it's you there for you. Clear option here. Yeah. yeah, it's there for you, um, yeah. but cautiously and again, loving. I like that. That word benevolent is good there too. Uh, benevolent for their severity. Benefit. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, for their benefit. If you it's know, going to hurt or harm them, it's not for their benefit. Jim Nestigan uh, liked when, we, when he would teach on the Ten Commandments would say, you can't rule your house with the gospel. Every house needs a Moses. Mm -hmm. And he used lots of examples and I can use similar ones for my own children. Yeah. If I forgave my children every time they trespassed the law, well, we'd probably be leaving in a tent actually because they'd have burned down the house by now. By forgive, you mean look the other way and don't do anything. Yeah, exactly. Like, yeah, yeah forgive in the sense of like, oh, that's just kids being kids. You got to let them do, you know, got to let them be kids, got to let them be themselves. No, they would put, like I've said many times, they would have put so many holes in the drywall yeah. and crashed and broken. I mean, my kids break things, you know, same thing. Kids break things naturally. What's, what's just, the expression? You got to crack a few eggs to make an omelet make an or omelet, something? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's terrible. No, but I like the idea here. Um, I think one of the other things that we probably have a problem with is like, um, it's, it's that tribal idea that we would say that, you know, like a whole nation is our enemy. Mm -hmm, well, yeah. There are a lot of people within a nation, even an, even right. not everybody's going to buy into the agenda. Right. You know, there may be those who are, are passive, right. uh, ob obediently, you know, passive just for the sake of preserving their own neck. Right. Um, right. You know, so you have to be very clear about who are the enemies right. here and who are the, right. who are the ones that you're going to address. Right. Um, and then, well, yeah. you know, think of, we, t I think we talked about this a few episodes ago, mm -hmm. the, the Christmas day thing uh during world war one right, right where, yeah, they, where they came out of the trenches and yeah. and they they had a they celebrated christmas together and then yeah. they went back to killing each other and it's right. like really right how do you how do you do that right and i think that, that's a great overlap between national pride and mm -hmm. sheer lunacy at that point yeah because that's not to me benevolent severity would be at that moment when you're singing christmas hymns saying wait a minute what are we doing <laughs> Like, why are we doing this? We're maybe Christian maybe brothers. we're not enemies with one another. Maybe actually the enemy are the people who sent us here. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, and going back to, since I've been talking about all stick to that, like in Outlaw Platoon, Sean Parnell talks about that, that there were people that were openly antagonistic and hostile towards American troops being where he was at in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, they, they're like Jocko talks about, they're just normal people. They want the same things that everybody wants. They want safety. They want education for their kids. They want a better life for themselves. They want a city that's free of crime and they don't have to worry about who's coming through the door at two o'clock in the morning. They don't want to be terrorized by these evil people, these satanic agents. They want the same thing I want. So for the most part, once you secure their security, the people there are like, we're really happy you're here. Yeah. And then yeah. you have that group of people who are benefiting from the chaos and the terror. And then you have those people who are um, perpetrating the chaos and the terror. And so you're there and there are moments, like I said, where you, the severity is called for, but if you don't maintain the moral high ground and you say, I'm not doing this to just punish you. Yeah. 
I'm doing this because you've left us no option at this point, because morally you're so evil, or in the case of, of like the church, you're spiritually so evil that there's nothing left to do except confront it head on. And whatever happens, happens. Well, and what I, I think we forget um, in, in thinking about warfare is that um, we're talking about people's hearts. Right. And uh, I think we're, if we're honest about ourselves, we know that they don't change overnight. We, right. Our opinions don't change. So, uh, you know, there's, there's been in our lifetime multiple times where, you know, the, the popular opinion and even that coming from, let's say, Congress is that we need to get out of certain countries that we've um, been involved in. And you're like, well, how is that loving? Right. Right. I mean, you're going to say, for example, you push, push Saddam out. Right. And then, and then uh, whatever it is, the Kurds, right. Who take yeah. over. Right. And then, and you set up and this then, protective front and you allow them to establish the society and, and it's going really well. And then, and then the calls back home are like, you got to get out, you got to leave it. Right. And then you're just, it's like uh, Jesus talking about uh, casting out the demon. And then he goes and he gets seven more and comes back to the empty house that you've left vacant. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Like really you're, no, if, you, if you're going to commit to this. Well, listen to Jocko talk about Ramadi. Same thing in Ramadi, yeah. Look at, if you're going to commit to this, you can't. This is, this is not an overnight thing. It's not. Right. This might take lifetimes. Right. You no. Know? Yeah. Um, if, if you're going to do it right, if you're going to do it in a truly loving way. Right. Well, and I would say this too, and, and I'll reflect on myself because it's a more benign example than Sean Parnell's experience or, or friends of mine who are veterans, but violence changes you. Mm. And there's things that you might voluntarily enter into. You're like, I would like to change this about myself, or I, you know, I want to, I want to prove something to myself. But there's things that you're naive to that until it happens, you're not aware of. Yeah. And you can never go back from that. You can never be the person you were before that violence occurred. Um, walking back even further to 1997, eight. Uh, when I was living in Portland, Oregon, uh, my roommate and I stopped a guy from raping a girl in a car. Mm, mm -hmm. And I've talked about it before, I couldn't leave my apartment for three and a half days. Like just that moment, I couldn't sleep at all because every time I closed my eyes, I just, I replayed everything that happened over and over and over again. I couldn't escape it. And my mind from the trauma was like, if we go outside, how, who's to say that there, it's not, there's not more of that out there. In fact, my brain was so like committed to this cycle that it was like, well, what if he got out of jail and he's out there? What right. if he lives right down the block and he sees you walk by his apartment? Well, literally the curtain got pulled back and exactly. you saw. That's exactly right. At the time, and I'd come out of Mexico, like I had seen things in Mexico that I talked right. about in the, in the Warrior Priest podcast uh, Sunday. Like I saw horrific things in Mexico that didn't traumatize me half as much as that moment did at that time. And that changed me forever. And my whole approach to the whole topic changed me and changed my heart. Like at that moment when that happened, the very next day, I'm like, well, I need a gun. I need a gun right now mm. that I can carry with me all the time. I don't care where you get it from. Find somebody that has a gun. And I had to have my pastor talk me down off of that, like just to convince me. But he had to preach into that, what I was feeling, what I was thinking, that whole experience but he didn't diminish the physical earthly consequences by simply preaching a, a quote unquote spiritual message and saying, but listen to Jesus, believe in Jesus, you know, perfect love drives out fear. He addressed it. He addressed it in a very concrete real way, real way and said, this is evil. Like you said, he, he addressed it. This is evil. What you did, you stopped evil. Mm -hmm. What you did was brave and heroic. And I'm like, well, actually I didn't want to do it. <laughs> when I heard her scream, I knew that was a scream of terror, not a scream of someone coming home from the bars. Yeah. And my first thought was, don't listen, close the windows. And then my friend who was in the Marines at the time in basic training came out and said, did you hear that? I'm like, yeah. And he ran and I had to run because he ran. And my thought then was like, if he gets killed, it's my fault because mm -hmm. I'm a yeah. coward. That also affected me then. I didn't want to go out there. I didn't want to save her. So I had to live with that too of that. Like in that moment, I was like, just ignore it. Pretend it didn't, it wasn't what you thought it was. Explain it away. Mm -hmm. So if not for my friend, she would have been raped. And in a very earthly sense, I had to go through that with my pastor. But then in a higher sense, I also had to address with my pastor the evil that was happening. And it wasn't just he was drunk or high or whatever or, or, or sober and just decided I'm going to have her. If you would have seen his eyes and saw how not there he was yeah, at that moment and that he was trying to get a hold of me and my roommate and my, you know, I'm trying to distract him. 
and he's bigger than I am. And my friend's trying to get her out of the car and the doors are locked and she's panicking and she can't unlock the doors. And he's trying to get a hold of me. And I know in that moment, I still to this day know from that moment, if he had gotten a hold of me, that would have been that. Yeah. Because he wasn't seeing me as a person. Mm -mm. It was just, I need to destroy you to get, and he kept trying to get back to the car. That's the thing. Like, as soon as I was out of, like, I would spin around him. So he, I was out of this field of vision. He would just turn back to his car. And then I have to like get back in front of him and distract him like a bear. And that was really then when I encountered that and went through that with my pastor, that's really when we started having the conversation about the two kingdoms in a very concrete, meaningful way for me that I'd only really read about in Luther before that. Right. And I think likewise, then when it comes to violence, most people have never been punched in the face nowadays. You know, a generation ago, it was pretty common to fight in the schoolyard or get in fights after, you know, behind the football stadium. Or right. Right. Just, just be rough and tumble kids. Um, I grew up in, in wrestling. Like we wrestled in elementary school all the way through high school. Mm -hmm. It was just normal. Whereas my kids have, you know, well, my kids have been punched in the face, but um, from jujitsu and stuff, but most kids have never been in a fight. Most adults I know have never been hit in the face. They don't even, they're not even conscious of the consequences of violence. So I think that's a part of it too of, well, but the new Testament says turn the other cheek. But to your point then, and to my point, but what if turning the other cheek results in the permanent damage or destruction of your neighbor? Mm -hmm. Because when that girl cried out, when that young woman cried out, she was, she was right there in front of me on the street. She was right down there, right? Like a block away. She was right there. Yeah. That's my neighbor. Yeah. So this is a you paradox know? as, as uh, the author said at the beginning in Augustine, mm -hmm. but I think in the scriptures too, yeah. that uh, on the one hand, yes, you turn the other cheek, um, you know, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, right? Yeah. On the other hand, um, you are the agent of that vengeance. Right, exactly. In that moment, and and it's not always official. I think that's the other challenge. And I Augustine, because rarely it, it's official. Yeah, Augustine talks about that. You know yeah. that. Well, there's no. It comes up in the next paragraph, but whatever. Yeah. You know that, that. Next. Okay. Well, then we should just read it. Well. I mean, oh, next time, next time we'll yeah. come back to it. Yeah. Yeah. That you know. I mean, even self defense. You're not. You know. You can't take a life, and you're like, well. Yeah. Um. I don't know if you're. That's always something that you can control. I mean, maybe that's your yeah. principle. I know um, guys that did three tours of duty and never fired their weapon. Isn't that incredible? I know a guy who was over there for a day <laughs> and was in a firefight. It's like... On day one, yeah. Yeah, and you know, the one guy goes and he's like, just so you, you know, this is a really hot zone. There's lots of IEDs. We take fire all the time. And he's there in an entire deployment, doesn't fire his rifle at all. Another guy's like, yeah, this is fine. We're just going to make a milk run. We're going to run up here to this, the fire base that's up there. We haven't seen any action in like three weeks. First day out, bang, 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 bang. Yeah, yeah. You know, or like Jocko describes, they were getting shot at. They'd never been shot at before. They're like, what's that sound? And mm. they look over like, oh, those are tracers. Oh, we're being shot at. Yeah. It's the same way in, in regular life. It just is. And I tell people, you have less than three seconds to respond to violence. Right. And I think the biggest danger, and you mentioned it way at the beginning, uh, I guess this will be episode two, so it'll be sure. episode one for this one. week, but talking about how, um, I think the challenge is trying to justify your actions. I you, don't. We, That's the thing. Because if you do that, I mean, you're trying, you're going to be able to explain <clears throat> away any behavior. Right. Ultimately, you're going to find some right. excuse for the way that you acted. Right. And instead, I'm, well, I would even argue if you want to do this spiritually, I mean, um, that you live a life of repentance. I was you know? just going to say that I think for me anyways, personally, that's what I've had to live with and, and think through is, is I don't want to justify fighting mm -hmm. because I don't believe there's a justification for it in a, in a big, in, in relation to my God, I have no justification for it. Mm -hmm. I'm the tax collector at the back of the temple. Therefore, I know that every day that I go in and train and every fight that I sign up for and, and engage with everything that I do, even, you know, weapons training and stuff like that. There's, I can't justify that to God because the fifth commandment, like I said at the very beginning, it's, it, it, you won't murder. It's, right. very, it's very simple, actually. It's explicit, yeah. Don't take another life, period. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, whatever. So I don't believe there's any justification for it in, an, in that sense. Therefore, when I pray, that's pretty much always in the top three as mm -hmm. far as please forgive me for this. However... You're not using forgiveness as an excuse either. Exactly. I think that's the most important point for this part is 
you can use repentance as a justification for violence. Well, it's, it's like the, uh, the addict who falls off the wagon and then comes and confesses their sins and then uses the absolution as a justification to go right. off the wagon again. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> like, I'm not doing that. Um, and I don't, when I talk with first responders or vets, I don't, you know, we, this is what we talk about is, is you, you know, if you killed somebody, you killed somebody. Murder is murder. Mm-hmm. Justified or not. A, on, in an earthly court, you are innocent. It's not like you're putting your number of kills on your helmet or something. Sure. For most. <laughs> for most. Right. Um, for guys from Vietnam, that was, it was a different time. It was a different war and that's, I've talked to from Vietnam. It was a different thing. Mm-hmm. Different time. And yet, that's my point is that they come, we talk, they confess, let's say. And then we talk it through philosophically. We talk it through like we're talking through right now. And then I say, okay, let's go to the altar. Yep. And now I'm going to put my hands on your shoulders or on your head. And I'm, yeah. now I'm going to absolve you in the name of Jesus Christ yeah. and call you to repent and receive the body and blood for the forgiveness of your sins. And you may be called in your civilian life to take up arms again for the yeah. protection of your neighbor. And when you come back, we have an understanding now. You understand this philosophically. You understand this practically. But you also stand, understand this theologically. That mm-hmm. it's a paradox. It's a dichotomy. It's not good. I'm no, it, it's, and but it's not even a good we, Well, if the world were good, we wouldn't need police. Yeah. And it's not even necessary evil. I mean, I, I think no, it's, it's not, a, it's, it's not it's evil necessary. either. It's a necessary good. Actually. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If it's benevolent severity as, as yeah, I like that says. term. I like I that term. Too. I'm going to chew on that for the next week until we hit record again. But yeah, I, I just think that because like we talked about before we hit record, because we don't talk about this anymore just like we talked about with the human trafficking episodes. We don't talk right. about it. So what ends up happening, I think, is we try and diminish the conversation. We flatten the playing field. We make it monolithic. It's either evil or good. And then we just turn our, our eyes away from it because we just don't want to confront it. We have no capacity to actually even have the conversation or even right. to think critically about our own actions. Right. So then how yeah. am I supposed to teach about this in Bible study? How am I supposed to preach about this from the pulpit when the when the... It's not, and like we talked about, it's not even my congregation's fault. They haven't been allowed to talk about it either. Mm -mm. You know, we read uh, Martin Luther on how a Christian should respond to the plague in Mm -hmm. April. And the folks that were at Bible study were stunned by what he wrote because it was that dichotomy between loving neighbor and being faithful to the call. Right. And basically Luther's saying, you're free in the gospel to flee the plague or stay. He's basically, you're an adult, love your neighbor or love your neighbor by leaving, whichever mm-hmm. it is, you know, but your vocation is like he says, if you are the sole pastor of a congregation, you may not flee the plague because you are responsible for serving your congregation. There's no one that can take solely. You. Yeah. But if there's five of you, four of you can leave. If one of you says I'll stay, that's mm-hmm. also loving your neighbor. Mm-hmm. If there are people dying in the streets, open your church up and turn it into a hospital. He says, because that's loving your neighbor. But if there's already somewhere set up, like at the palace or somewhere else, for the, your people to to go when they're sick, then keep your your church free of the plague. Yeah, and then you throw and, family into the conversation. Right. right, and so in relation to COVID, it was a really fruitful conversation to have because at that Bible study, you have people who are, I'm going to go about my life, and other people saying, well, I've sheltered at home, and I'm only coming to church, and I'm only going out for groceries. And so that letter from Luther provides a foundation for us to have a conversation not just with each other, but founded on God's word to say yeah. it's not as simple as both sides want to make it out to be. Yeah, so and that's what I was going to say is now the party lines have been drawn. And yeah. uh, at least in my experience, uh, yep. people have made up their mind. Either right. they're going to stay at home until yep. there's a vaccine or something, or they're yeah. going to come to church and be damned, whatever. Right. And I'm like, it's possible that we still might right. say, hey, look, we can't meet together right. for a little time because there's been an outbreak in our, in our group. Yeah. You know? And maybe then again, the same thing with war, we have two sides. They've made up their minds. It's either entirely wrong or entirely right Mm -hmm. versus it's not a necessary evil or a necessary good, but rather that's not even the right question to ask. No. The question to ask is, is this benevolent severity? Have we considered both sides, both Mm. that, you know, are we, is this the sad duty that we now have, that God has laid upon us. This is the cross that we must bear now in our vocation. It's not being imposed upon us, but we look and we see our neighbor's need. And right. this is the, this is the best we can do right. Right. today. Yeah. And like I was, and like we'd said, so your neighbor 
is who's ever right in front of you, which means if my, my little sister Brittany's in front of me and someone's attacking her because of the color of her skin, I'm going to step in front of that. Mm -hmm. I'm going to, I've mm -hmm. trained it with her and I've trained for her every day in case that ever happens. But if it never happens, I'm not going to go looking for a fight because I'm not called by God to do that. Right. Exactly. But I'm always prepared in case. That's the point. It's just as like a parent. If you think you're entitled to be a parent and you take that lightly and then you're called upon to be a father and you make a complete mess of it, well, what have you done to prepare to be a father? Do you listen to your kids? Do you pay attention to your kids? Do you reflect on your parent? Like I said, when I discipline my kids with that benevolent severity, almost immediately I am stricken with regret. Mm -hmm. And I want forgiveness, not just from God, but from my children. But I'm also smart enough as a father to know we got to let the emotions kind of simmer and then come back around and go, okay, we both lost, lost a little bit of control there. We both got emotional. We right. both said things we didn't mean. Um, let's talk about it. Yeah. Why, why did you do that? Why did you get so out of control? Why were you yelling at me? Why did, this, I, you know, why did I discipline you? This is where both the, you know, David, the psalmist, and mm -hmm. then also, you know, Paul. I mean, it's true that we can do nothing without it also yeah. being corrupted by, right. you know, some right. selfishness. We do it. Right. The good we, that I want to do. Yeah. And it's never, our motives are never pure. That doesn't mean we do nothing because right. we can't do it. Right. You know. Yep. Which is the problem with warfare. It's like, well, we could do nothing. We could be pacifists, um, but then we neglect our neighbor at times. Right. Yeah. Right. Hmm. So Good. next time we'll read more in this fascinating topic. At least for me, it's fascinating. I actually have to give a presentation on this to our circuit pastors. Well, you'll be ready to go. In either November or the spring, whichever. Um, but we haven't but, talked exactly about what just war is. What is a just that's war? That's what I was going to say. I think that no. I've never actually liked that term. So I think in the next mm -mm. two episodes, we will dig deeper into that whole question well you kind of you don't mind augustine but you really don't like thomas so that's probably why well yes let's just <laughs> say thomas wasn't real big into physical activity <laughs> let alone war <laughs> so, uh, so all right well thank you as always thank you for listening your time and attention is valuable to us and we appreciate that you give it to us and listening to these things i just got an email about civil disobedience while we were talking about i know isn't that funny you know so um, that can even be a part of this conversation. And yep. uh, I hope it's helpful for you. And like we say, whether you agree, disagree, or you're indifferent, I hope that we make you think. Otherwise, we love you and we'll talk to you soon. There you go. Fade out.